Good afternoon, everyone. It is April 9th, and this is uh, the first of our mini lectures for this week as we talk about the 1960s. I just want to spend a couple minutes thinking more in depth about 1968. Uh, if you remember from our larger Zoom meeting on Monday, I said we were going to focus on the period from before 1968 on Monday. We weren't going to get um, into that period where things tended to take a more radical turn um, and an angrier turn, as you will probably note from watching episode six in the Vietnam War documentary series. So 1968 has been referred to as an annus horribilis, or a terrible year for United States history. It marks a low point of uh, patriotism, a low point in support for the Vietnam War, and a high point um, in terms of polarization in the United States and, and violent polarization between uh, pro-war pro and anti-war candidates, between a more radical civil rights movement and people who want to start pulling things back, sometimes under the sort of coded dog whistle term of law and order, which we'll see come up throughout the 1970s and 80s as well. So it's a really stark um, moment um, and a really frightening moment for many people who lived through it. I just want to go through a couple of reasons why that is um, and how that's going to shape um, what, how we, what we're going to talk about as we get to the 1970s and particularly uh, the election in 1968, the end of 1968 of Republican Richard Nixon, who, if you'll remember, lost his presidential run in 1960 to the young, liberal, and charismatic uh, John Kennedy. Uh, I also want to note that a lot is going on globally in 1968 as well that we won't get uh, into detail with but just as a note, not only is the war continuing in Vietnam, uh, the Tet Offensive, but student protests are not just an American thing. Uh, major protests brought Paris to a halt in the summer of 1968, student protests in Mexico City, and also in the communist Eastern Bloc countries in Europe, like Czechoslovakia and Prague, the Prague Spring, where uh, liberalizing socialist candidates wanted to change um, some of the authoritarian um, and Soviet-backed policies and, and open up um, additional freedoms. However, we're going to focus on uh, the United States. So starting uh, just a re recap of the Tet Offensive. Uh, so early in 1968, during the Lunar New Year holiday of Tet uh, in Vietnam, North Vietnamese troops and the Viet Cong, or, a, or South Vietnamese mil paramilitary organizations groups that uh, supported the North Vietnamese, coordinated to attack numerous cities uh, throughout South Vietnam, including Saigon. So it's the first time the southern capital of Saigon was actively attacked. Uh, the idea was to uh, sort of spark um, an uprising among ordinary people in South Vietnam in support of the North uh, and to break, this, break the, the willpower of the Americans and break um, sort of in a more physical and literary, literal sense, um, excuse me, literal sense, uh, the South Vietnamese army or Arbin uh, attacks went out everywhere. There are, um, and, and despite um, American forces sort of militaristic, military, militarily speaking, um, legitimately saying that the Tet Offensive was a massive defeat for North Vietnam. Um, that's not how it was interpreted by many people in the country. Um, the war seemed to be going on much longer uh, than anticipated. The Gulf of Tonkin incident that ramped up American involvement and started the draft which began in 1964. So this is four years um, in a war that we were supposed to win quickly. And uh, there's a lot of frustration. It's also the first war that is televised into people's houses. Um, so we have color television uh, coverage of this war, in, of the war in Vietnam, and a large number of journalists who are right on the front lines. Um, so if you remember the beginning of the video where the helicopter, former helicopter pilot is talking about, you know, landing right after his mission, and there's a journalist asking for his opinion. Um, we have an enormous amount of uh, 
audio and visual imagery of the Vietnam War from that, that perspective, um, which also really changed the way people understood war, that brutality of on the ground fighting, which happens in most, in, in many kinds of warfare, just wasn't viewed um, by ordinary citizens. I'd like you to think a little bit, you know, compare some of that news coverage we're getting in the documentary to the propaganda films that we saw about World War II um, and how different that is. So that was already sort of uh, shifting American resolve and how many Americans were viewing what was happening in Vietnam. Meanwhile, as we get head into, later into the year, uh, two major assassinations in 1968. First, that of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, which led to widespread rioting um, in African-American communities and, pro and violent protesting um, throughout the country, but particularly uh, in urban areas and in the North. So we can also see this reflection of um, a sense that King's um, nonviolent message had ultimately failed. And it seemed to, to mark that, and then the later assassination of Robert Kennedy after winning the California primary seemed to suggest that this liberalism and positivity of the early 1960s um, was, was, poor, was not founded on, any, on, on anything in reality, and that hard, harder measures, um, more aggressive measures needed to be taken or more. Also, there's mention in the film, uh, again, of student occupations and movements. Uh, the student movement becomes extremely focused on the anti-war movement during this period and large-scale protesting um, that will continue into the early 1970s, um, particularly after 1969, when not only does the draft continue, but the draft lottery becomes televised as well. Uh, but in 1968, again, a lot of student and, um, protest after the Tet Offensive, including the occupation of Columbia University. And this leads to a change in the relationship between higher education and students. Administrators really worried about um, what students were going to do. Um, you might feel, you might have your own opinions about uh, the administration at, at uh, Sewanee, but uh, there's a sense that students have some power. You know, students are paying tuition. They, they have certain expectations. Um, administrations during this period start to see students as, uh, in some cases, and particularly student activists, in an adversarial light, in some cases, resorting to force. Um, most famously in the early 1970s with the Kent State Massacre when the Ohio National Guard was called to put down um, protests at Kent State University. Um, but Kent State was not alone in uh, more policing of student activities after the occupation of Columbia. And finally, uh, we have to talk a little bit about uh, politics. So the Democratic National Convention in Chicago was a cluster F. Um, just as a note, primaries and caucuses were not common uh, or not universal in 1968. Um, most states did not hold a primary uh, and just sent, uh, sent parties, just sent um, members to conventions uh, to talk about what was going on or to, to support a particular candidate. It was very inside the party. With, with a few exceptions. Um, so this mix of some states having primaries and some states not having primaries uh, is the basis for the disaster that happened in Chicago in part. So Hubert Humphrey, who was uh, Johnson's vice president, if you recall, Johnson um, declined to seek the nomination after it became pretty clear he was not going to win. Um, so Hubert Humphrey, his vice president, um, was nominated at the convention. Um, despite the fact that he was not on any primary ballots and the majority of people who did have the opportunity to vote in a primary, so the majority of Democrats who had the choice to vote, voted for explicitly anti-war candidates, either uh, Eugene McCarthy, uh, who won 34% of the vote, um, or uh, before his assassination, Robert Kennedy, who won about 30% of the primary vote. Uh, this led to a, a large amount of demonstration outside the convention of people who were both an strongly anti-war and those who were very were pro-primary, so thought that primary votes should 
better indicate what people actually want. Uh, and eventually led to violent clashes with the Chicago Police Department, which had been called a police riot. Um, so you really have a lot of uh, police officers sort of taking things into their own hands, their frustration with these protesters who had occupied um, occupied parks in Chicago. Um, there's also a slight, there's also a class dynamic to this. Um, again, police officers um, were more likely to sort of be in the category of those who were drafted or um, <clears throat> or had more you know, closer ties to people who were drafted or involved in the war effort. And you know, some of the protesters did things like fly the North Vietnamese flag. Um, so sort of beyond anti-war to um, in the views of some pro-communist. Um, so this led to a especially violent riot um, and represents um, sort of the problems that are within the Democratic Party, and it's also an opportunity for Republicans and conservatives to say that, look, this, what we've been doing is absolutely not working at all, and that kind of stark difference is represented in some, in many cases, by the commentary at the DNC, uh, by liberal commentator and novelist Gore Vidal um, versus uh, William F. Buckley, uh, the editor of the National Review, uh, which was the organ of sort of uh, uh, conservatism at the time. They were uh, two leading um, <clears throat> sort of speakers at the time and their context of the debates is really indicative of this, this split and this polarization, this, this, this strong polarization between the left and the right, um, and as well as within the left itself as the Democratic Party uh, kind of crumbled. All right, so on that note, that is the end of 1968. Um, uh, Hubert Humphrey was nominated. He was extremely unpopular, both with anti-war liberals and with Republicans who would you know, prefer a Republican, um, and one who they thought would have a better handle on how to end the war in Vietnam. And, and, and Nixon is able to present himself as the answer um, to the conservative uh, anxieties and is elected in 1968. All right, uh, so that is it for right for now. Um, I will see you Monday and look out for another video soon on the 1960s and the women's movement. All right, see y'all.